I greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ and welcome you to worship today. We are sharing in communion, so I hope that you have a moment to gather whatever supplies, if you do have bread and juice uh, to, to put on your table as we share together, that's wonderful, but we will together bless whatever elements you have uh, before you. Our scripture lessons today come from Isaiah chapter five and from Matthew chapter 21. And so I invite you to open your mind to invite the spirit in and just simply pause and breathe deeply as we listen to our prelude and enter into the spirit of worship. Please join with me in our call to worship. We are created in the image of God. We are commanded to love God and one another. We are required to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. We are called to follow Jesus and walk in His now let us join together in singing or, singing or reading along with our hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth.
God in our prayers together and also in our own quiet offerings in our personal confessions to God. So let us pray together. Loving Christ, you gathered your disciples together long ago and called upon them to remember you, your love, grace, and forgiveness. Even though some betrayed you, denied you, or doubted you, you love them, just as you love us. We know we all fall short, and yet you still call us friends. Today we gather with our siblings around the world to share in this simple meal in which your presence is made known to us in a new way. Loving God, hear our confession for our own wrongs and the past wrongs of the church. Help us remember we are created of you and you call us to see others as you see us beautiful in your sight. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within. To be in Christ is to become a new person. The past is done. Today we begin anew. Friends, let us help each other to believe the good news. In Christ we are free and forgiven, cleansed of the past. We live today and into God's future. Amen. to be with you. No, with you. <laughs> Let us now come into the presence of God and listen for the word of God. As I open up the scriptures from the prophet Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it and in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Jesus, in another parable today, also brings us the image of the vineyard. 
Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches into a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the, at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. I can imagine you being there, and I hope you're all having a beautiful fall season. And today I have a few questions for you, so you're going to have to answer them. I want to know what kind of rules you have in your house. Can you tell me, any, or in school, what are the rules that you are asked to follow? Pastor Sue. Well, I'm the one who makes the rules in my house, so. <laughs> How about for me, one of the rules I have to follow is follow the speed limit. Don't speed. Okay. Michael, what kind of rules? Maybe you know some from school. I'm sure you do. Be respectful, be responsible, be honest, and safe. Brian? Love each other whenever we can. <laughs> All right, so we have rules, and I'm sure your parents have given you things to do that sometimes you may not like to do, but you've been asked to do them. For instance, please don't hit your brother or sister, or please take and clean up your room, or all the different things that are maybe rules in your house. Well, we're going back to Moses again. And you know that man, he, he did an awful lot. And remember when we first started talking about him, he had a problem where he stuttered, and he just said to God, I, I'm not gonna lead these people, I can't do it. And God said, yes, you can. And so sure enough, Moses was instructed to lead the people out of Egypt and into the promised land and of course he had no idea what he was doing and if you've ever been wandering for 40 years I guess you get pretty tired so remember the Red Sea it had to be parted and he did it and they got through and came to the other side but then if you remember what happened people decided they were getting hungry and that's when God told Moses that they would put out uh, quail from the heavens 
and that there would be manna. And of course, we talked about manna. And manna was there everywhere, everywhere they could look. And so, you know, you'd think, okay, everything's going really great. Well, sure enough, then they ran out of water. And of course, last week we talked about Moses and he was told by God to go and strike a rock. And what came out of that rock? Water. Now, who would have thought that? But today we're talking about Moses in another way. He was always being told what to do. I mean, God just kept on him, let's say. And God was looking around and thinking, things aren't looking so good right now. So Moses went up to the top of a mountain. And I think we've all heard of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Rules to begin with. And so they're there to keep you in line. Have you ever colored a picture at school and you just, uh, and it was all over the place? And then another student made it all beautiful, inside the lines, that kind of thing. Well, God's looking at you like, okay, we're going to try to keep this in the lines. So there were ten commandments, and Moses brought them down the mountain on tablets and showed them to the people. Now, they were serious. Not so much don't hit your brother, but probably don't kill somebody or don't be jealous of other people and all the other rules that came through God to the people. So, we're going to hang in there with Moses. He's He's a man that's really done an awful lot from a very, very meek beginning. And hopefully you can take some strength from that and have a really good fall as the leaves are turning and everything's looking so beautiful. So let us pray. Loving God, you have directed Moses in so many ways. You have showed him that you can accomplish so much. And he was a faithful servant who followed all that you had to share with him. Please help us to understand that God does take an interest. God knows what we are doing. And God only wishes the best for everyone. In your name we pray. Amen. drive into work that is about half highway and half back roads. And on those back roads, I'm always watching for changing signs of nature as I pass through. There's woodlands in some neighborhoods, but a lot of it is fields and woods. So in winter, of course, I strain to find the green buds that are coming out in the midst of all the gray. In May, I always look forward to the scent of honeysuckle and roses that come at the same time. Then there's the autumn olive in the air. And then in midsummer, there's sweet pepper bush. I can tell the seasons by what it smells like. And today, I noted, as I drove through a sort of tunnel of trees, that there was a drastic color change from just even a couple of days ago. This time last week, all those trees, that tunnel of trees as I went up the hill, were all green. But today, they were yellow gold. And as the sun shone through it, it really looked like, kind of like the, everything was just alight with the sun. It's that gold. And the leaves, of course, are already on the ground. 
If we take the time to look around us, we see the signs of autumn coming. And nature has a way of keying us into what is going on in each season. But we only see it if we pay attention. Now, if you're a person who spends any time at all in your garden or in your yard, if you're a farmer, of course, you notice the seasons even more so. Or maybe you only get out there to mow the lawn reluctantly. But no matter what, when you are out there in your yard or out in the, the wilderness around us, you expect to see certain things at certain times of the year. And then it's noticeable when things are off. Like I was saying, the leaves are already off a lot of the trees, and this is even before October came. So it's a little early this year, but that says to me that it was a dry end of summer and those leaves have already fallen. Now, I, I talk about this, this natural world and the signs it gives us because our scriptures give us also an image of this vineyard, uh, a place in nature, where when one is looking out on this vineyard, no matter which scripture you're reading, you see that things are off. And so our scriptures recognize that there is something going on, that there is something wrong with the world. And if we were to sit back and just read the gospel lesson, read the prophet, we might, it might take us down our own paths to recognize where things are off in our own world. Maybe it's in the environment. And of course, my mind goes to the West Coast where literally almost the whole West Coast is on fire. And those vineyards that are out there are being consumed by the blazes. And we also know that there have been hurricanes that have hit not just in various areas, but repeatedly in certain areas. Maybe we might think, notice that things are off in, relation, in relationship to other people. Maybe when we used to go and we used to run into people and have maybe just casual conversations or with someone in line at the grocery store, we notice that those conversations aren't as easy because perhaps an idle comment we might make could start an argument or a disagreement. Maybe we find that courtesy isn't common courtesy anymore. And I don't think any of us can miss that things are off in our country's political arena. And since that area is so fraught with tension, that's all I'm going to say. But all our texts have to do with that offness. And they use that image of the vineyard. So let's look at Isaiah. The Isaiah, we have God, which is it's God singing of the beloved who are the people of Israel. And they're planted like a vineyard in their new land. It's a love song that harkens back to God's act of creation in which we can kind of hear the echoes of, and it was good. So God has planted God's people. We talk about Moses delivering them from captivity into a new land, giving them what they need to live. And then we find the grapes that are planted are now wild grapes, or they've gone bitter on the vine. And the beloved people of God have forgotten their belovedness. They've forgotten or turned away from their relationship with God. And so what is the landowner to do? What is the vintner to do? Tear down the hedge, break down the wall. The people who were planted were supposed to be a people of justice. And instead, they warred with their neighbors and oppressed one another. Well, Jesus takes the vineyard Im in image even further, in sort of a disturbing way, too. He expands that song in Isaiah 
to a parable that includes tenants. Tenants have leased this land. They didn't respect the servants or the landowner. They seized them and beat them and killed some of them instead of handing over the produce. And then at last, in a final attempt to have some sort of persuasion to make some sort of sense, the owner sent the son, for he thought the tenants would respect his son. But instead they kill him, hoping to gain his inheritance. As we take note of these despicable acts, hindsight will tell us that again, this landowner is God, Jesus is the son, and the tenants are the religious leaders of the day. So when Jesus asks, what do you suppose this landowner will do with the tenants? Literally, the crowd replies, and I say literally because I'll explain. The crowd replies, he will annihilate those evil evils because the Greek word for evil is actually used right next to each other twice as though to say that these are the worst of the worst. They're doubly evil villains as one scripture, uh, as one preacher said, they are evil squared. But that is the religious leader's response not Jesus' response to these tenants that have killed everyone. Instead, he quotes the psalm, and it's one that we are familiar with, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The religious leaders have rejected him, Jesus. We've looked at the parables the last couple of weeks as well, and they've all been about the kingdom of God. And in Jesus' view, the kingdom of God, this is when the world, our world, gets turned upside down. But this parable today speaks a little bit more clearly to God's intentions for God's beloved people, for God's people for for God's people and, the, and all of creation, that God intended life, not death. God wants to be in partnership with us, that we are co-creators and caretakers of the world. And as we go back to that image of nature or of the environment, we can imagine that if we are co-creators and caretakers of this world, we have to recognize that we have harmed and even destroyed God's creation in some places, distorting God's purpose for our own gain. And when God gave Moses the commandments to give to the people, which is the story that Kay uh, referred to today, <coughs> the commandments given to the people was God's intention for the people to remember who God was and who they were that God was the one who brought them out of their oppression and that they were a people consecrated to God. And so I hope today that this is something we can remember. We always need these reminders of whose we are and who we serve. And as we come together on World Communion Sunday, let us remember that God's intentions for us are to live as God's people, to care for creation, to care for one another, and to live into God's reign. And when I say that, I mean that we can't wait for things to change or for some lightning bolt to come strike out of the sky as a wake-up call. We literally have to live the kingdom into being. And we can only do that if we can rely on Christ to lead us and to also fill us with enough of grace to be able to share that with one another. And so we come to the table to renew Jesus as God's covenant of love for us and for all of creation. And we refresh ourselves into Christ's service to our world and to one another. 
So yeah, maybe things might be off out there, but we have the richness of God within us that we can tip the balances. We can right the wrongs. And it only begins with us. Amen. Our hymn is number 329, Jesus, the Joy of Loving Hearts. of prayer, I lift up that our flowers have been given by Joe and Chris Serwinski in celebration of Mackenzie's 21st birthday and to the glory of God. I also want to lift up that uh, Bev Sawyer's sister, uh, we just need to keep her in our prayers as she's dealing with some heart issues. Also, um, Pray for Patty Danley's son, Mark Ball, who had surgery on Tuesday and for his healing. We also want to lift up that our friend Lee Guire was in the hospital in his home. And so we keep Lee in our prayers for her healing. And we pray for all of our sisters and brothers in Christ around the globe this day for all who share at this communion table that literally is spread around the world with the presence of Christ. So I invite you to be in the spirit of prayer with me. O gracious and holy God, we come before you this day. Some of us are anxious, some of us are tired, some of us are looking forward to getting out into this beautiful fall scenery that your creation has provided for us. Some of us may be reluctant to go out into it because we know it means raking leaves and doing yard work. 
but no matter where we find ourselves physically, spiritually, or emotionally, we are welcome into your presence, O oh God. Help us be reminded of this when we feel we are not heard, that our voice just echoes in the wind and makes no impact. Help us to know this when we do things with good intent and sometimes stumble and fall and miss the mark. Help us to know that we simply need to turn to you to find your renewal, to put our trust, our brokenness, our fears, our hopes, our celebrations, all in your hands for your healing touch, for your forgiving mercy, and for your grace that lifts us up despite the times that we fall. Gracious God, we pray in thanksgiving for Mackenzie's 21st birthday. We, we pray your protective spirit to be upon Penny as she may undergo some more, uh, some more doctor visits and uh, perhaps treatment. We pray for Mark as he heals and for all of his family who are looking after him. We pray for Lee and we pray for all of those in our congregation who need your healing, especially for those who are battling cancer or struggling with financial issues, for those of us who bear the burdens of others and are caretakers by choice and not vocation. Be with us and be with all of your people on this earth who seek to live into your ways, who come together perhaps in just small groups in this time of COVID virus that is still infecting our world in various levels. Help us to remember that the precautions that we take to mitigate the spread of the virus keeps its instances low for which we are grateful in our own area. But help us to remember to look at the world and know that there is, there are places that are worse off and could use our help and our prayers. Hear us now as we come to you with what weighs on our own hearts. Our prayers, O oh God, breathe in us and through us as we prepare to share the blessed meal with Jesus at his table as we come together in Holy Communion. Amen. Please join with me in our service of Holy Communion. In the time of Jesus, to be one of his followers was risky. Christ's followers met both in public and in secret. In the early years of the church, some met in freedom, while others gathered 
under the threat of persecution and death. Around the world today, some who come to the table are ridiculously wealthy and some in desperate poverty. This is our We all share at least one thing, the table of our Lord. And in many languages, when we come, we all sing, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so on the night when he would be betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after blessing it, he gave thanks and broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said to his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, and often, as, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. The bread and the cup around the world will be different. Some bread is unleavened and flat. Some comes in big round loaves. Today we share what we have in front of us. The cup will be wine or it will be grape juice. Maybe it will be water. And in some places it is only imagined for they have little but the spirit to gather around. <clears throat> but no matter what we gather around, no matter who we gather with, we pray together and if you're at home, you can hold your hands over the elements as we pray. Holy God, as Jesus once took bread, may you bless this bread that we share, that it may be for us the body of Christ. Bless this cup, that it may be his blood of the new covenant poured out for us for the forgiveness of our sins. May your spirit also move upon us that the presence of Christ may be made known in us and through us in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup, that we might be renewed and refreshed to go forth as your people living into your realm and bringing your kingdom to life. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. The blood of the new covenant, the cup of blessing. Take and drink in remembrance of Jesus the Christ. Now let us give thanks for what we 
and so many around our world have shared together this day. O oh God, we thank you for knowing when we are hungry before we ourselves know it. We thank you for the friendship of Christ that has a meal ready for us when we are weary and have come up empty, powerless to provide for ourselves. Grant us the humility and enthusiasm to keep coming back to warm our hearts around this hearth of your making, Christ's feast of love, now and in all our days. Amen. And now let us join together in our hymn, The Church of Christ in Every Age. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you this day and give you peace. Amen. Let us go in peace. <laughs>